Hi friends, Father Kerry Walters here, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church, and this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one on some words of wisdom on the sin of poverty offered by an 18th century American Quaker. My friends, I'm sure it comes as no surprise to any of you that the economic gap between haves and have-nots in this nation is becoming steadily wider. Over the past 20 years, household wealth has increased, but it's increased primarily for the top 5% of households. And most other households in the country are simply trying to maintain a steady state, which is not easy because household wealth for all of the other people in the country tends to be rather stagnant to such an extent that many people who once belonged to the economic middle class have now fallen below the poverty line. As a matter of fact, um, two-fifths of the total household wealth in this nation is now concentrated in the top 1% of wealthiest households. There's something terribly, terribly wrong about this skewed distribution of wealth in our society or in any other society. It's important that we try to figure out the causes of this maldistribution by examining it economically and, and sociologically and politically. There's no doubt about that. But we Christians also need to try and understand the problem from a spiritual perspective, because the Christian church has always taught that when poverty is the consequence of a skewment of wealth in a society, it is a sin. Not a sin on the part of the people that are poor, but a sin on the part of the people who are causing others to be poor. And that's where this 18th century American Quaker, who I referenced earlier, comes in. I'm speaking of a man named John Woolman. Woolman was born in 1720 and he dies in 1772. Now, if you're at all familiar with the name John Woolman, it's most likely because you know something about his a campaign against slavery in the American colonies. He was an abolitionist, my friends, before abolitionism was even a movement. And he was influential, as a matter of fact, in persuading his fellow Quakers in the colonies to condemn the practice, the sin of slavery. He wrote two very influential pamphlets on slavery. He left behind him a journal, which has become a classic uh, in American literature. He also wrote uh, on the abuse of indigenous peoples on the part of white settlers, and he wrote on the sin of poverty in a little pamphlet entitled, A Plea for the Poor, or A Demonstration and Warning to the Rich. The pamphlet was probably written in 1764, 1765, although for one reason or another, it wasn't printed until about two decades after Woolman's uh, death. Now, Woolman, of course, is a Quaker, um, and Quakers have as one of their fundamental principles, as we'll see in just a second, the notion of simplicity. Simplicity of desire, simplicity of behavior, simplicity of lifestyle. He seems to think that poverty, the sin of poverty, is caused primarily by what he calls the spirit of selfishness. The spirit of selfishness goes completely against the grain of the virtue of simplicity. This is how he describes the spirit of selfishness. He says that it is a complex of selfish desires and imaginary superiorities which darken the mind. Of course, what he seems to have in mind here is the ego-driven life. Uh, the id, I might even say, driven life in which our own desires, our own needs are, are of paramount importance to us and everything else takes a back seat. I demand this particular commodity, that piece of land, this sizable fortune because I believe that I am entitled to it because it assuages all of my desires and everybody else's interests or needs or desires has to take a back seat to mine. This spirit of selfishness darkens the mind even more. It darkens the inner light, the presence of Christ within us, the indwelling Christ, which Quakers talk about to such an extent that we do see 
to paraphrase St. Paul, through a glass darkly. And we see through a glass darkly because we've darkened our mind and we've darkened our heart through selfishness. What woman thinks we need to do is to somehow overcome the spirit of selfishness such that the inner light can shine forth once again and remind us of who we are and who other people are and what the best way to live is. For woman, the Quaker, the best way to begin to retrieve the darkened inner light is to obey, to honor, to embrace what are known as the six testimonies in the Quaker tradition. These testimonies are virtues which we need to absorb and then to practice if we would follow in the footprints of Christ. And the testimonies are peace, equality, integrity, community, simplicity, there's that simplicity again, and stewardship. Now, even though Woolman doesn't explicitly mention the six testimonies in his A Plea for the Poor, it seems to me that if we read between the lines, they really do serve as the foundation for everything that he has to say. There are three ways in which the uh, spirit of selfishness particularly expresses itself from an economic perspective. And the first way is it encourages an inordinate desire for luxury, for swag. And the reason that this inordinate desire for luxury encourages the rise of poverty is twofold. The first is that people who desire luxury tend to accumulate more and more money so that they can buy more and more luxury. Because of course, there's a quick half-life to luxury, isn't there? We crave this particular new toy, and once we get it, we play with it for a while, but we quickly tire of it, and so we need the next toy to uh, satisfy this itch that we have. The more money we accumulate so that we can buy luxuries, the less money other people have an opportunity to earn. And moreover, luxury creates the need for other people to make the luxurious items that we want. And that kind of work can often be demanding and unrewarding. So we're creating not only material poverty in our demand for luxuries, but kind of inner or spiritual poverty for the people who have to work at making those luxuries. So in talking about luxuries or superfluities, to use his 18th century word, I don't think it's out of place to see that what Woolman is doing is invoking two testimonies, the testimony of integrity and the testimony of simplicity. Simplicity, for obvious reasons, but integrity as well, because what is integrity? Well, it's a kind of integration. Uh, of our character with our behavior in the world. And both are fragmented if we demand much more than we actually need in the form of superfluities or luxury. The second way in which the sin of uh, poverty is encouraged by the spirit of selfishness, according to Woolman, uh, is the vast concentration of wealth in just a few hands. And the vast concentration of wealth in just a few hands means that the wealthy can manipulate and control to a large extent all of the other people who depend upon them for wages, for example. This always puts the wealthy in a superior dominant position to those people who depend upon them for a living. And that kind of a relationship for woman the Quaker is always unhealthy because God made every person equally and God loves all people equally. Therefore, it is amiss for some people to lord it over others because they have managed to accumulate more wealth than others. Moreover, as I've already suggested in discussing luxury, this disparity of wealth tends to rob people who depend upon the wealthy of time. They have to work longer and harder, says Woolman, in order to make enough just to get by. They have less leisure time, less excess time in order to improve themselves or in order simply to relax than the wealthiest people do. And the third troublesome thing 
that the spirit of selfishness encourages and which contributes to the sin of poverty is violence. Woolman points out that the more we own, the more protective of it we become, the less willing we are to give up any of it. And what that means is that a wealthy person or a wealthy nation for that matter begins to see everyone else as potential adversaries, as threats to my own, our own accumulation of wealth. And what that does is to create the power dynamics that frequently leads to national violence and interpersonal violence. Wealth, the disparity of wealth, creates that kind of an unpleasant situation, says Woolman. In robbing people of time and in robbing people of wealth, we certainly are violating the testimony of equality. And in wealth creating the likelihood of power dynamics which lead to violence, we are certainly violating the testimonies of stewardship on the one hand and peace on the other. So these are the problems that arise when wealth is maldistributed, all of which contribute to the sin of poverty. How then, says Woolman, should we redress this situation? And this is where it seems to me he's particularly interesting. He argues that there are three paths to breaking the back of the sin of poverty. Universal righteousness is one. Inward tenderness is another one. And other regarding, or the spirit of love, is a third. Now, what does he mean by these? Universal righteousness seems to mean for a woman, for us to be in a right relationship with not only God, but with all human beings throughout the world, and perhaps even, he hints, animals. Universal righteousness means that we leave behind the spirit of selfishness and we begin to offer ourselves in the service of others, recognizing that that's where our true riches will lie, in helping others, in serving others, in sharing with others. Because God made the earth and all of its riches, all of its goods for everyone, says John Woolman. And consequently, the righteousness, the right relationship that I have has to be equally distributed amongst all the people of the world. In a really interesting way, in saying this about universal righteousness, what woman seems to be anticipating is the 20th century Catholic moral principle of the universal destination of goods. The universal destination of goods doctrine has it that because God created the world and all of its goods for all people, the ultimate destination of those goods shouldn't be concentrated in the hands of one or two people or one or two nations, but should be spread fairly and equitably throughout all of the world among all women and men. Inward tenderness. Tenderness, of course, is an important word in the Quaker tradition. And what it tends to mean is empathy. Woolman says over and over and over again in his A Plea for the Poor that the wealth tend to remove themselves so far from the people who work for them, the people over whom they have power, the people who have to labor constantly just to make a living, that they have no real appreciation for what those people endure. Woolman says, I bet you that if a wealthy person were to spend one day, one week, one month, living as a laborer lives, that the wealthy person would immediately recognize the sinfulness of the spirit of selfishness. Empathy is all important in doing something about the maldistribution of wealth that creates the sin of poverty. And towards the end of his A Plea for the Poor, Woolman actually devotes an entire chapter to schooling, to educating youngsters to be able to appreciate through empathy, the plights of those who might be less fortunate than themselves. And finally, the other regarding of attention to love. When we love, says Woolman, we will never engage in power dynamics. We will recognize that instead of seeing the other as an enemy, as a possible adversary who's trying to take what I have, 
we will see the other as a family member bound with us through the bonds of Christ's love and will act accordingly. So these three principles that woman talks about in his little pamphlet on poverty, he thinks will offer a spiritual way out of the sin of poverty. I might mention that he wasn't just a, uh, a person who wrote about these things. He lived them in his own life. Um, Woolman, among other things, was a merchant. And at one time, he came close to becoming wealthy. And he considered that a great danger to his spiritual health. And so he quickly retreated from his role as a merchant. He sold off all of his merchandise at extremely cheap prices, gave a lot of the money away, and for the rest of his life lived very simply as a scribe, um, as a um, person who would write letters and documents for his illiterate neighbors. He always dressed simply in homespun cloth. He ate simply. He was a vegetarian, as a matter of fact. Every aspect of his life exuded the opposite of the spirit of selfishness, which he believed was the cause, ultimately, of the sin of poverty. My friends, I really, really, really do recommend to your attention his short and very readable pamphlet, A uh, Plea for the Poor, which can easily be found online. I'm Father Kerry Walters. Thank you for watching. I hope that you will consider subscribing to Holy Spirit Moments. God bless you. I will see you again shortly.